Good evening. I'm Penelope McPhee, the president of the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. And on behalf of Mr. Blank and his family, I'm honored to welcome you to our home tonight for our speaker series program on the power of public murals. We've hosted more than 30 of these speaker series on many, many different topics, but I'm thrilled about this one because it's the first one we've done that's really about the arts, which is my personal passion, so welcome. I want to especially thank Doug Hooker, Carrie Armstrong, and Gregory Burbage and the entire Atlanta Regional Commission team for partnering with us tonight and for taking a leadership role and building the arts across the Atlanta region. You'll he hear more from Carrie, ARC's chairman, in just a minute about an exciting new mural arts opportunity that ARC is bringing to Metro Atlanta. I also want to welcome everyone tonight who's joining us via our live webcast. For Twitter users, you can join the conversation at at Blank Foundation and use the hashtag at ArtsATL the way it's written on the screen, capital A-R-T-S, uh, capital A-T-L, just like you see it. Share your comments and questions, and we will actually try to ask some questions from our Twitter audience when Jane and I do our Q&A in a little bit. My immediate interest in tonight's program began almost exactly a year ago when I was privileged to participate in ARC's link trip to Philadelphia. You'll hear more from Carrie Armstrong about the link trip. Let me just say that with that encounter, Jane Golden lit a fire under the ARC mural arts program across the metro region that engages communities in the arts. So we're very excited about that second promise kept. We have a long way to go to achieve the success that Philadelphia has achieved. Started modestly in 1984 as a city anti-graffiti program, Jane's program today reaches into every neighborhood in Philadelphia, and it reaches internationally, but you'll hear more about that later. It involves 2,000 individuals in its three programmatic initiatives every year and engages over 18,000 people in its, over 18,000 residents in its projects. The program has produced more than 3,800 works of art. But as you'll learn from our speaker, it ain't about the paint. Reading the core values that drive Jane's program, and they're on the back of our program tonight, you can see that art is a vehicle to bring people together to build community, and to imagine a different world. Jane was generous to get up at 4 o'clock this morning to get here to spend the day with our team, the ARC and Blank Foundation team, touring some of the existing mural sites in Atlanta and the region. Jane, we're grateful to you to be here tonight to help us learn how, to use another phrase from her values, we can think deeply and create fearlessly to use the arts to empower individuals and communities. And in the spirit of one more of Jane's core values, we beats me, we're grateful to ARC for partnering with us tonight and for the participation of so many of you from across our region. The we in the room tonight is a little bit different group than we usually have at our speaker series. We are often too much an inside the perimeter group. Tonight, we really have representatives from all over the region, from 35 cities, towns, and counties across the metro area, from Kennesaw to Hapeville, from Duluth to East Point, and many others. So this is a first for us, and it's evidence that the arts really can serve as the thread to stitch our region together. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Armstrong, ARC's Chairman and Senior Vice President of Pope and Land. Thank you all for being here. Thank Carrie, you. thank you. Thank you.
Well, the first thing Penny did to me is take the first page of my remarks. So will you see, look at the back of your stack and see what you did. I'm going to start by uh, with the last page of hers, and we'll see if we can confuse everyone. Good evening. Gosh, what a great thrill it is to be here and to look across the room. I see a lot of faces that I know and a lot of new friends. Uh, many of you I've met and um, some I'm about to, but thank you all for being here. And, of course, thank you to the Arthur Blank Foundation and to Penny uh, for gathering us here and being the spark plug uh, that got this engine started this evening. As chairman of the Atlanta Regional Commission, or the ARC as we're often known, I usually talk to groups about transportation, population growth, economic development, land use, and our aging population. But tonight I'm here to talk to you about public art. Now many of you may not associate art with ARC or ARC, but in May of 2012, our board voted to incorporate the arts and culture into our planning efforts for the 10 county metro area, a fairly unfounded thought. In doing that, we recognize the value of the arts and culture to the quality of life and the economy of the region. And we made a commitment to grow the region's reputation as a flourishing center for the arts. To honor that commitment, as Penny mentioned, I'm happy to be here today to launch the Atlanta Regional Art Program. The goal of this new program is to commission and install public art of all kinds throughout the Atlanta region. The seeds of this program were planted, of course, on ARC's link trip to Philadelphia in 2014. Many of you here this evening were on that trip and you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who were not, link is a cross-sector, cross-county leadership exchange organized by our organization that takes the region's most influential leaders uh, on an annual trip to another city to learn how they do it, to look at another metropolitan area throughout other metropolitan areas throughout the country and address and how they address the same re issues and challenges we face in Atlanta. In Philadelphia, the topics we explored range from community investment and quality of life to transportation and economic development. But one speaker in particular excited and provoked the link trip participants, and that speaker was Jane Golden, who you'll meet in a moment. Jane talked about the power of public art in relation to community engagement and community development. And after hearing her inspirational talk, Many participants on the link trip were moved on the spot to make two very specific commitments. The first commitment was that the group, made up of civic business and nonprofit leaders, many of whom are again are here tonight, pledged their own funds to launch a regional public arts initiative in Metro Atlanta. Actually, Jim Roden is here this evening, and he's the spark plug that got that started. He said, hey, I want to make a pitch and see if some of these folks will kick into a fund. And we said, yeah, make your pitch. So he did, and then he said, okay, who's in? And through the next 15 minutes, we either cajoled, shamed, or thrilled people into contributing about three quarters of a goal of $100,000 uh, that went, generated right there. So two words, thank you, Jim Roden. And secondly, if you talk to him after the program, keep your hands on your wallet. <laughs> the second major commitment was to bring Jane here to Atlanta so we, she could share the excitement uh, with us that we experienced in Philadelphia while we were there. And we are here today to fulfill both of those commitments. With the launch of the Atlanta Regional Public Art Program, we're setting up a competitive grant program that will use the funds pledged last year by LINK participants to provide matching grants to local governments, community improvement districts, neighborhood associations, and nonprofits for the creation and installation of public art. What inspired LINK participants to pledge funds after hearing Jane was the way her program in Philadelphia used public art not just to beautify communities, but to engage community, uh, to encourage community engagement and act as a tool for community development. Those are the goals we hope to achieve in the Atlanta region. Now here's how it'll work. Organizations will apply to receive matching funds for the creation and installation of public art in their communities. Once an organization is selected, they will choose an artist to work with their community to develop a public art installation that responds to a regional theme. We have chosen a theme for, this, uh, for the start of this that allows each community to celebrate their individuality within the region. And the theme is this, there is ample opportunity to make history in Atlanta. Each community that receives funds will interpret this theme in their own unique way and will work to develop their response through a variety of community engagement tools. We understand that collaborative public art will be new to a lot of communities in Metro Atlanta. 
So ARC plans to offer workshops to provide training and technical assistance for both artists and project sponsors. These workshops will guide participants throughout this process, and we can't wait to see what they will come up with. And when I say we're launching this program today, I really do mean it. Immediately after tonight's program, you can go to our website, public.atlantaregional.com, to read about the program, download the application information, and sign up to receive updates about workshops and other information related to the program. Please check it out. Now for our second and maybe the neatest commitment and the one that brings us all here tonight, it is my great pleasure to tell you a little bit about Jane Golden. Jane has been the executive director of the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program since 1996 and has become a driving force for community engagement, community engagement through public art in Philadelphia and throughout the United States and really around the world. She has overseen the growth of Philadelphia's famed Mural Arts Program as it developed from a small city agency into the nation's largest such program. To date, this very impressive program has created over 3,800 landmark uh, works of public art through innovative collaborations with community organizations, city agencies, nonprofits, schools, the private sector, and philanthropic communities. Her program has grown into a successful model for community development through public art that is used across the country and around the globe. Jane was initially hired by former Philadelphia Mayor uh, Wilson Good as a young artist to help combat the graffiti crisis plaguing the city. She envisioned the mural program as a way to get graffiti writers to turn their destructive energies into creative ones. Think about that. The murals they created helped to transform city neighborhoods suffering from years of neglect and hardship. As the mural arts program has developed, Jane has used the process of muralism to connect communities to public outcomes. She has developed innovative art education, restorative justice, and behavioral health programs that serve young people youth and older offenders at prisons and detention centers. Her programs have made it possible for thousands to experience and witness the power of art to connect young people to their communities, to break the cycle of crime, and to bring about healing in individuals and communities. Thank you again to the Arthur Blank Family Foundation for gathering us here tonight uh, and for helping us to fulfill the commitments that we made in Philadelphia a year ago. We're especially excited about the potential for expanding art throughout the region, and we are very, very thrilled to hear from Jane Golden, the individual that inspired us to begin. So please help me welcome Jane to our podium. Okay. So tonight, we're going to talk about what happens when you stretch art as far as you think it can go, and then you decide that you want to go further. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk, I want to talk a bit about how I got involved in this work, um, then talk about um, our beginnings, because it very much informed who we are today. Then um, we're going to uh, look at a lot of the work throughout the city and leave time for questions. So my background. So I went to Stanford University. I was a double major, fine art and political science. Um, I thought I'd go to law school. Um, when I was at Stanford, I was painting, you know, very large paintings, and then I moved to Los Angeles. And when I got to LA, I saw these glorious murals everywhere. They were just magnificent. And so I was like, oh, this is, you know, like, look at these murals. And in my head were the voices of my painting professors who said, don't go to law school. What you should do is get a job that's really boring, that won't take away from your creative drive and get a studio and paint. And I remember telling my parents that, and they're like, oh, I don't know about this advice. So I you know, got a boring job, I was painting, I was unhappy, I was miserable, I felt isolated and alone, and I saw these murals, and one day when I was coming home from my boring job, I opened up the LA Times, there was an article about the LA mural program, and I was like, oh my god, they're hiring. <laughs> so I was like, I could paint a mural. So I called them up, and they said, oh, yes, you could paint a mural, but you're past the deadline, you can come back next year. So I said, well, what if I wasn't? They said, well, you have to find a wall, do a design about the community issue, you have to hire people from your neighborhood, but you're, like, past the deadline. So I was like, okay, I, like, hear you. So I thought, hmm, let me just walk around my neighborhood in Santa Monica. So, like, I saw this really great wall, and then I thought about Santa Monica. There had been a pier at the end of the street. The city had torn it down. I said, well, maybe I could do a mural about that pier. And then um, I thought, well, I'm just going to knock on the door of where that good wall is. So I knocked on this door, the door, 
and this like strange looking guy answers there was a paper mache cow outside this business that said love animals don't eat them i can't believe i remember this it was like i feel like it was like a thousand years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth i was like how do i remember so this guy says, says hello and i said oh hello my name is jane golden and um, i would love to do a mural on your wall so he said okay so i said no seriously i would really and he goes that's fine so i said would you like to see samples of my work? I said, I'm a graduate of Stanford University. Is it that would impress him? He was completely disinterested. He was like, whatever. <laughs> like, so I said, well, um, I said, so I just want to get this straight that you're going to let me, a stranger, paint a mural on your wall. And he goes, that's right, and please don't say it again. So I said, okay, well, I happen to have, I said, in my, in my pocket, I said, I happen to have a little form here that I've designed. I said, would you sign my form and give me permission uh, to do a mural. So he said, I, Ronnie Bruce, give Jane Golden permission to do a mural. I'm like, thank you. So I go back and I work on a design. And then I have this design. And I go around my neighborhood and I ask strangers if they'd work with me. And everybody's very friendly. So I'm like, great, great, great. So I call back the city of LA and I ask if they would reconsider an application from me. And they said, um, absolutely not. You're past the, you were past the deadline three weeks ago. You're still past the deadline. Like, what aren't you hearing? I said, well, I just thought I'd try. So then I, okay, so that's not working. So then I drove downtown and I dropped off my application. <laughs> but then I did something and my husband said, and he knows me, I'm like the most tenacious person on earth. And he goes, did you really do this? I called him every day for three months. I do this with the city of Philadelphia all the time. It's like every day at three o'clock I go, I'm gonna call them. So finally, and this is like my campaign started, I don't know, in September or October. Finally in December, I get a phone call and I go, hello, and I hear someone say, um, they must just recognize my voice. They said, um, we hope we never hear from you again. So I'm like, oh, who is this? And they said, it's the LA Mural Program. You have the grants. They were like screaming at me. I'm like, I have the grant, but they were so hostile. I'm like, They're <laughs> I'm like, but you sound like you hate me, but you're giving me good news. So I was like, oh my God, I have the grant. <laughs> the grant was $300 <laughs> to do a wall 20 feet high and 100 feet long. I'm like, oh my God. So what do I do? So I, I have no idea how to do murals. I like lied on my application. I said, I do murals all over Stanford's campus. Like, who is gonna go check, right? So my paintings were large. I figured that counted. So anyway, so I go to the library. I research mural painting. I like, I like go back to the people in the neighborhood who were like virtual, still strangers. I'm like, I got the grant. They're like, great. I mean, every, you know, people in LA were so enthusiastic. So I'm like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna paint this mural. And so everybody was like happy and thrilled. And we went out there and we painted this mural. I tell you this story because standing on that corner of Ocean Park in Maine was an extraordinary experience because everything I thought about murals was sort of theoretical or I saw murals from a distance. I thought murals are great. I thought it then, I think it now, because I believe everyone should have access to art. And I think that's like, not, it's not something you negotiate around, right? I, don't, I love galleries, I love museums. I just don't think art belongs there exclusively. So standing on that corner and talking to many strangers about their lives, about the community, about politics, about neighborhood history was absolutely exhilarating. There's no other way to put it. And it hit home for me about the importance of this medium. And then about halfway through, I'll tell you a funny story, halfway through the mural, there's an article in the LA Times about this project. I'm so happy. And this Man drives up, I'm up on the scaffolding, and he has a very fancy car, and he gets out, he's in a suit, and he's very serious, and he goes, are you Jane Golden? So I'm like, yes. He goes, you don't, you don't, he goes, my name is Herb Bolger. I said, oh, hello. He goes, that's not familiar to you, is it? And I'm like, oh my God, is this like a trick question? Like, what is going on? I'm like, is he with the FBI? Like, I, did, I was like starting to panic, you know? Like, and he said, um, I own this building. So I looked down the street to where the, the strange looking man who signed my form was, is, was there. And he said, he's the tenant. <laughs> I'm like, oh, right, there's a difference. E. So I, I didn't know what to say. So I said, do you like it? <laughs> he goes, I love it. I'm like, oh my God. So then when it was finished, people said, it's so great. You've got to get a celebrity to dedicate this. I'm like, I am 22 from New Jersey. I don't know anybody famous. They said, Jane Fonda lives up the street. I'm like, wow. So I go up the street, I'm totally covered with paint. I knock on Jane Fonda's door and she answered. And I was like, and I said, oh, hello, my name is Jane Golden. 
and I would like to know if you would cut the ribbon at the mural, at my mural dedication. And she goes, I'd love to see young women working. I've seen you pushing scaffolding, you know, lifting gallons of paint. I would love to come to the dedication. Is there anything else I can do? And I always joke with my colleagues now because now, of course, I've asked her for a donation, right? <laughs> then I was like, well, you can bring friends. I didn't know what else to say <laughs> to Jane Fonda. <laughs> Just like, be cheery, be nice. And she did. She brought a whole posse of people. So anyway, it was great. It was exciting. It was thrilling. And I decided, I love painting murals. I'm not going to law school. So I started painting one mural after the next, after the next. Then I got really sick. I have lupus. So, and, you know, it was like, people, the doctors are like, you're not going to live long, and it was like horrible, you know, to really feel your mortality. So I came back east, I grew up in Margate, New Jersey, and I started to get better, and I decided I didn't want to go back to California, and I thought, what am I going to do next? And so I thought to myself, you know, I really like Philadelphia, maybe I'll go, maybe now I'll go to law school, maybe a temple. So, but then I read an article about a new program in Philadelphia a program called the Anti-Graffiti Network started by our first African-American mayor in the city of Philadelphia, Wilson Good. And Wilson Good said in this article, he said, there is a social epidemic now. Graffiti is everywhere. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a program that is not going to be your typical program. I want to clean up the city, and I want the kids who are writing on walls to clean up the city. And it occurs to me that a lot of the kids like art. And I just glommed onto that sentence, right? And I thought, that could be my job. <laughs> like, why? Right? So I thought, well, send my resume to Wilson Goods office, and I could call there every day. Right? Like, <laughs> I know how to do this. I can. So I send, I send in my resume. And one night, I had gone to the movies. I remember this so vividly. I came home, and my dad is awake. He's downstairs. He goes, you won't believe who called tonight. I said, who? He said, someone from the mayor's office in the city of Philadelphia called a man who was the head of arts and culture on, like, no way, I can't, couldn't believe it. And he said, yes, his name is Oliver Franklin. He knows your work in LA. He wants to talk to you. So I like barely slept. Next morning, of course, I probably started calling the office at 6 in the morning. I finally get Oliver Franklin on the phone. He goes, come up for an interview. So I fly up to Philadelphia. I just sit down. I talk to Oliver Franklin. He goes, look, I think that you would be perfect at the Anti-Graffiti Network. I'm going to send you to see Tim Spencer. I'm like, great. So I go see Tim Spencer. I walk through this office that is pandemonium, right? There are kids, there seem to be detectives, there are people on the phone, there are community organizers. And I get through the people and I go talk to Tim Spencer. And Tim has a vision. We're going to clean up the city. We're going to work with kids. Some of the kids like art. You know, we'd like you. You could run our programs. You could have the job. It's $12,500 a year. Your title will be field representative. Do you have any? Oh, yeah, you'll have like a 1,000 kids. Most of them are graffiti writers. Do you have any questions? I was like, well... Um, I'm not sure. So he just said, well, and I said, oh, I'll take the job. I, and, you know, so I was just like, okay, sold. So then he goes, oh, wait a minute, one more thing. And he goes under his desk and he gives me a box. And in the box, there were magic markers and paper. He goes, here are your art supplies. <laughs> I was like, great. Like, and where do I go with my box? And he goes, oh, yeah, down the hall. So I went in this room and it had clearly been like a closet, I think, up until the day before. So I was like, okay. And as I'm walking through, like, I'm like, there are like all these I guess graffiti writers, they are graffiti writers, and they have backpacks that make clicking sounds, and people are like, what's in your backpack? And they go, books. And I'm like, and then just, like, these kids are running out in the hall and like spray painting at City Hall. I'm like, this is a mess. This is crazy. But you know, my whole life, I've loved reading crime novels, and I thought, I am in one now, right? I am like living on the edge. I have no idea what I'm doing. But my challenge was to find graffiti writers who liked art and change their lives. Like, really? Like, OK. Like, how is this going to happen? So how it happened was, like, was exactly like this. And I want to say one thing about Wilson Good before I go further. Because, see, Wilson Good was very brave. Because he put $6 million of city money on the table to create anti-graffiti. I have known in my life a lot of elected officials from all over, right? And you can talk about a problem all you want. But unless you're going to fund it and really do something about it, Change is not going to happen. And not only did he fund a program, he stood up to the naysayers. And he said, you know what? We're not going to just white out graffiti because you know what? It is not working. Not in Philly and nowhere across the country. So we're going to do something differently. We're actually going to employ kids. We're going to train them. We're going to teach them. We're going to give them opportunities. And we're going to go into the neglected neighborhoods of this city. And we're going to transform things.
He was very brave. And so I felt like this was hugely exciting to be in Philadelphia in 1984, 85, and 86. And in some ways, because of Moon, history has not been that kind to Wilson Good. But see, I think that he was a great mayor because he stood up for the underdog, because he went into marginalized communities, because he started all these new initiatives, and because he helped kids all over the city. And because of anti-graffiti, the seat of power was open to kids from every neighborhood, every neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. It was unbelievable. And anti-graffiti was structured like this. There was something called an amnesty pledge. You see how happy everyone looks here? <laughs> they are really happy because they are swearing they're never going to write on walls forever, <laughs> which wasn't true. Then they had to do scrub time. Then they were sent to me. So I had to quickly fly into action and do something, right? So what was I going to do? So the city gave me an undercover police car. It was very strange. It was completely dented, and when you beeped the horn, the trunk flew open. It was <laughs> the oddest thing, and people behind me were always annoyed because I was like, sorry, <laughs> got to close the trunk. So, but I like love this police car, and the kids I worked with loved it too. So I drive around, and I saw these graffiti pieces, some of them tags, so they were obviously so just some was just under the heading vandalism. Some of the graffiti pieces were really good, and I'm like, somebody's got a lot of talent here, so what am I going to do? So I said, okay, we're going to start programs at rec centers, community centers. I called the Philadelphia Museum of Art, just said, okay, I'm working with former, I emphasize, former graffiti writers. They took the pledge. Can we come have programs on Saturdays? They were like, yes, yes, yes. So I said, that's great. And then um, I was given an assistant, and the assistant was someone who wrote graffiti everywhere. He was notorious. And through Tran, I started having conversations with graffiti writers and realized that, well, they're highly organized. They meet on Saturdays. They plan their routes. They're, you know, they, they have like, it's almost like they had a strategic plan. I, I mean, who knew they were so organized? So I was like, okay, so this means that we can actually infiltrate and make a difference. So if I can get the big name graffiti writers to, to like sort of get in touch with the fact that they actually like art, come to my classes, maybe they'll sign the pledge. Maybe we can create a movement to like get move the kids from writing on walls to being creative and creating art. So that's what we set out to do. And so um, through Tran, um, one evening, um, uh, he brought a lot of, they were not invited, uh, the, the graffiti writers to my home. And um, I, you can imagine what that was like to open the door and see all these graffiti writers there. And they introduced themselves as Cool Earl and Disco Duck and Knife and Pez. And they were on the most wanted posters in our office. So we, I invited them in, and I can't believe what I said. I said, would you, I said, oh, come in, we'll chat and have some tea. I have no idea why I said that. They came in, looked at my art books, got really excited. I gave, I was passing out art books. And the one fella, he stood up and he said that his name was Knife, which made my spine stiffen. And um, so I, he said he had some things to ask me. And what he had to ask me was, he asked me about what I thought about Mark Rothko, um, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, Matisse. I mean, he had an uncanny knowledge of abstract expressionism. Um, Hans Hoffman, it was really stunning to me because all these kids had dropped out of school in 10th grade. But knew about Mark Rothko, knew about William de Kooning. I mean, and, and it was because, they told me, they had been stealing art in America. Stealing art in America. Just think about that for a minute, right? I mean, like, if I was going to steal a magazine, I don't know if it would be art in America. So I was like, this is unbelievable. I looked in their black books. They had amazing drawings. So I'm like, all right, you guys, you have to sign up for anti-graffiti. You can do something artists in America would love to do. You can get paid to paint. Because after you sign, you pay your dues, you can come work with us. Because Wilson Good has put money on the table to help you. And they were like, well, we don't want to. You know, we want to be famous like Keith Haring. And I'm like, great. Only a handful of people are going to make it in America. Every year we can rely solely on their art. Where are you going to be when you're 25? Answer me honestly. Well, dead or in jail. So I said, okay. So now you're going to, I want you to sign up for this program. So we went through this dance. Finally, they did sign up for the program. It was a struggle. They wrote their name around the city at first. They wrote my name around the city. I would drive around and see Cool Jane. I've never been cool. I was like, that's strange. Stop writing my name. Stop writing your name. Just stop. We started classes at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The first class was like a disaster. I thought it was going well until the guards came in during one of our breaks and said, Miss, you've got to control those kids. It's a disaster. That was the word they used. I said, oh my God, are they writing my name on the museum or their name? I thought, I will never come back to Philly. And they said, no, they're in the cafeteria trying to sell their artwork to people from the suburbs. So I was like, <laughs> I was like that is such great news. I am so relieved. 
So anyway, so what we started doing, we started flying, we flew into action. We started doing murals. That's what I knew how to do. We were doing workshops, you know, teaching the kids about like, you know, color theory, design, perspective. And then we were like, you know, no, 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 no. I want, this, I want the kids to really make their mark on the city in big, bold, moving ways. I want them doing public art, real public art. So we started doing murals in the city of Philadelphia. And we drove around neighborhoods and talked to people, would you like art here? You know what people said? You know what we want? We want housing. We want jobs. We're really not interested in art. What is art going to mean to us? We never go to the museum. We're not going to Center City to look at the sculpture. We're just trying to make ends meet in this neighborhood. And finally, a group of committed women in North Philadelphia invited me to their community meeting. And actually, I have to say, they became role models and mentors to me. And at this meeting, Ms. Rachel Bagby said to me, you know, Jane Golden, the only visual stimulation we have in this neighborhood are billboards that advertise alcohol and tobacco. You should know that our kids will never have beauty. And I was like, but Ms. Bagby, that doesn't have to be. We could do a mural here. What do you want? She said, well, no one ever asks us what we want. Things are either not done or done to us. So what we want? We grew up on a farm in the South, and we want our kids and grandkids to know about where we came from. What we want? We want a mural of Malcolm X. What we want? We want a mural of Dr. King. What we want is our history on these walls. And we were like, done, check. We went out there and started flying into action and doing large-scale works of art. And you know what happened? People were stunned. Because on these walls that had been totally, and I mean totally defaced, the graffiti stopped. It stopped almost overnight. Like no one, the minute we started to put up a grid, no one would write on this. And the murals became beacons and focal points. Sometimes they were about people's stories or their histories, their struggles, their aspirations, their triumphs, their history, their history on large walls, mirrors that you hold up to people and you say, your life counts. Think about the power of that. You have felt out of the equation, marginalized. Your voice is not heard. And a project like this comes along. I am large, I contain multitudes. A, a quote by Walt Whitman. It had so much power that, it, that people said, you know what? You know that lot in front of this mural that's filled with crack vials and syringes? We don't want to take that. You, we were like, yeah, you, that's right. You don't have to take it. What should, we, what should we do? This was not art that was parachuted down from the sky or imposed on people. This was what is called today co-creation, co-collaboration. It was working together. And it was really valuing the opinion of the people who were there. I had people in the center city, my friends, artists, who would say, why are you doing so many landscape murals? I'm like, do you live there? Really, do you? I mean, I would say, do you live there? And then people would say, no. I'm like, then when I come to your neighborhood, I'll ask you what you want. Up in, un, until then, like, your, your opinion doesn't count. And they'd be like, what? <laughs> and and the, the art sounds were like, well, that's not art. I mean, why, is not, why isn't that art? Well, because the neighborhood's involved. I'm like, really? So the best moment was after we did a few murals, like this one, the art commission called us in. And people questioned like, our, how we worked. And Tim Spencer, my former boss, the executive director of Anti-Graffiti, said to the art commission, we answered to one entity alone. We answered to the community. And he said, and if you have a problem with that, you can call the mayor. And he stood there and offered to dial the number. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> And then we left. <laughs> and in a sense, like I never looked back. You know, it was a very empowering moment because I thought, that's right. Like there is not, and it's not like there's a right or wrong way of public art making, right? There's sculpture, there's working with a lone practitioner, there's working with a group of people. But to judge, we need to take that judgment off the table. And for years, I really struggled with that high art, low art thing, right? And now, of course, that's gone away. But so it was really interesting because it was a challenge to have the courage of your conviction and move forward no matter what was happening, right? Those were the lessons I learned in such a profound way back then. And when we did this mural, this was so powerful because this artist was doing murals in Los Angeles. He's famous, Ken Twitchell. And back then in 1989, he was getting about $50,000 a mural. And that was huge. And so I had a $2,000 grant from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. So I called up Ken. 
because she was like my friend. And I said, well, um, we have $2,000, and we'd like you to do a portrait mural in Philly. And he said, I'd like to do Dr. J in a suit. So I said, why? And he said, because I want kids to think beyond sports. So I said, okay, but you'll do it for $2,000, coming back to the money. And he said, yes, I will. So we tracked down Dr. J. Like that his, he was shooting a TV commercial, ran in. I talked to his agent. I was like, can I please and go talk to Dr. J? He said, well, whatever, go talk to Dr. J. So then I said, hi, Dr. J, my name's Jane Golden. I work with kids, I work with communities. He's like, slow down, you talk really fast. So he said, what is it that you want? I said, well, we want you to pose for a mural. He goes, fine, fine, fine. So he posed, and it was exciting. And why I show you this slide, this is so, like, I want you to think about this wall, totally covered with graffiti, and what's in front, like trash five feet high. And on the weekends, we would clear it out. And you know the neighbors, everybody helped. And we worked with Philadelphia Green, the greening agency. And it was really an amazing project. 1989. So go by there today in 2015. And what does it look like? It looks like it did in 1989 when we cleaned up this area and painted this mural. So this work withstands the test of time. And that is incredibly powerful. And so we worked with tons of kids. And then anti-graffiti, my former boss passed away, and I knew that anti-graffiti was going to be restructured. We had a new mayor, Ed Rendell. And so, um, and I decided I was going to just leave the city and go to law school. So I applied, and I got into law school, finally, after years of thinking about it. My brother is an attorney, and he said, well, I don't think you should go to law school. I'm like, what? And he said, no, I, I said, and what do you think I should do? He goes, you should run an art program for the city. I said, there isn't one. He said, then start one. Go see Ed Rendell. So thankfully, Ed Rendell was completely open to it. He said, you guys have been the steam engine for anti-graffiti. Um, where would you like to be in city government? I thought about it. And I said, the Department of Recreation, because they had a visionary leader, very progressive, and uh, Mike DiBerardinas. So um, he said, I'll check with Mike, and I'll get back to you. Come up with a name for yourselves. So we came back a week later. We said, we'd like to be called the Mural Arts Program. He goes, great, you're going to work at the Department of Recreation. Jane Golden, you're in charge. But it's like when you're little and you have a spy club and you have like 10 cents between you because our budget had been decimated, right? Because uh, anti-graffiti, the money had been split up between all these departments. So I was like, oh, I hardly have any money. So then I noticed Mike DiBerardinas was raising private money to open up swimming pools. So I went to him and asked if we could do that. And he said yes. So we started raising private money and matching private money with public dollars. And that was a key to impacting more people. And P.S., we were a pro-arts program. So suddenly, it's like, oh my god, we're not anti-anything. So we started working with emerging and established artists. We started, we opened our doors to all kids, not just graffiti writers. So the first murals we did, we wanted them to be super powerful. So Jackie Robinson, sliding into home. The Peace Wall and Grace Ferry. Here, in this neighborhood, all communication between whites and blacks had shut down. Shut down. There was a, there was a, there was a murder, there were beatings. And we said, we're going to do a Peace Wall and Grace Ferry. And people are like, oh, like... Just like back, back in the day in 1985 when we said we want to do murals and people were like, oh, you're so naive, what's a mural going to do? And here people are like, you're so naive, what's, you really think that people are going to talk to each other around mural making? So there was a deputy mayor at the time, Lillian Ray, I will always be grateful to her. She's African American, obviously I'm white, we were a team, we went door to door and we talked to people and we said everyone's saying the same thing. Everyone is saying the same thing. You don't like the way you're being treated in the media. You don't think anything can change. Show the world that change can happen. Do something public. Do a mural. So people are like, no, slam the door in our face. We're like, OK, we're making no progress. So it took us months and months, almost a year. We finally got a group together. We met at a church. We asked people what they wanted. They said they wanted hands. My husband's a filmmaker. He said, use real people's hands. So we put out a call for people to come to the church for a photograph. I'm like, who's coming? How are they going to like reach towards each other? No one's talking to each other. But they did. They did. This group of committed citizens came. We took that image. We projected it on the wall. And every night we worked. Every night we worked. And the mayor kept saying to us, there's going to be violence. You're going to get hurt. The crew is going to get hurt. You know, there's going to be vandalism. You know, really, it was unbelievable. Because really, people thought this. And I understood it. It seemed like it would fail. But it didn't fail. And the dedication down here was the most integrated event ever. And then we did like 12 major projects and ran programs. And my second job is I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And I love when the community members come from Grays Ferry because I like what they're talking about now, and that is economic development. I'm not saying that what we do cures everything that cities grapple with. But I am saying to you that murals 
show us the catalytic role that art can play in the life of the city, and we have proof of that. And then this happened. This is eight stories tall, completely glorious. Look at this, it's, it's iconic. Um, and this showed people that murals can be the same quality as the art you see in galleries and museums. And I love this because it gives kids in Philly the dignity and respect they truly deserve. It's absolutely beautiful. This is by Nick Salzman. And this is our mission. I like this. Empowers artists to be change agents, stimulates dialogue about critical issues, and builds bridges of connection and understanding. And created in service of a larger movement that values equity, fairness, and progress. I, I, I just want to say that what I think we're about, we are an art program, but we are a program that values equity and justice. And we engage communities all over the city. And we represent people and issues, and we try to do it with the utmost integrity, and we engage youth. And we have an evolving public art practice. We're growing all the time. So we're now going to go on a quick tour of some of the work of the city. And I think when you think, when you think about the murals in the city of Philadelphia, I want you to think about the autobiography of Philadelphia. Every community, every community is heard. Here are the Colors of Light by Josh Serentitis. And this one, Tropical Landscapes. So this one is a critical one because around this time, um, what we did is we started thinking not just of the, about the wall. When we, uh, we were working in this neighborhood, we started thinking of the lots. And so we worked with the Community Development Corporation to reclaim this entire space and create this park. And here, we became extra ambitious in 2004. This, this lot was almost the size of a city block, and it was just filled with trash. And we worked with the community members to do two murals that face each other. We, we had every, all the kids in the program studied African-American quilts. Um, this is Miss Jones. She was, uh, she's a matriarch of the community. But we worked with a number of greening agencies, reclaimed the space. And when we reclaimed the space, we noticed that the recreation center across the way was just a mess. It was a sea of glass. And we said, wait a minute, we've seen success here. What can we do there? How do we leverage this project to create something there? And so this brings me to another point that what this work necessitates is that one be highly strategic about the outcomes you want so that everything we do, we try to be as planful as possible because we wake up every day and say, how are we going to move the needle? How are we going to do it in a concrete, tangible way? And then we set about the business of changing this into this. This is a pocket park that's been transformed. Here we have a rowing mural along the Schuylkill River. Here we have a project that we did with Tariq Trotter from The Roots. And this is his mentor who passed away at a very young age, Dr. Sean White, who, who was a public health advocate and um, has his PhD from Penn. And he taught public health in barbershops. So we said, oh, how do we keep his legacy alive? I know. This is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do visioning for this project in barbershops and churches, just like Dr. White did. And that's what we did. So all the words you see on this came from the community. And then a wall like this, this is about the industrial history of Philadelphia. It's turned into this. And that's painted, part of it is paint, and part of it is done with graphite and charcoal that is glazed. Art education. Every child deserves access to art education, and we know, sadly, that it just doesn't happen. What happened with the graffiti writers is that we saw great talent that had sadly gone unrecognized. And when kids started to learn, they started to grow, and eventually they left that cycle of crime and joined the anti-graffiti network. And I can't tell you, it's thousands and thousands of kids took a, a rerouted from that dangerous cycle, that whirlpool of drugs and crime and vandalism, because they were, they were all really connected and went on to do wonderful things with their lives. And I know that because I'm in touch with so many of them now. Mural Arts Program, every year we serve about 1,500 young people. Some of them are kids who have fallen deeply between the cracks. They're at uh, juvenile detention centers, residential placement. And some of them are kids who love art, never been in trouble, but they're not going to get art in Philadelphia public schools. And so we have a high impact residency program. For the middle school kids, it's called Foundation, the Foundation Program. For our teenagers, it's Emerging Muralists. When you're a junior in high school, you go into internship, apprenticeship, or the entrepreneurial program. And then we have someone on staff who just navigates their next step in life. 100% of kids in our advanced program graduate from high school. 
85% are moving on to higher ed. Read the Philly stats. Read the Philly stats. They are not good. The dropout rate is high. But so many of our kids articulate themselves through art. So we take the recycling trucks and we turn them into this. We actually wrapped a fleet and the kids studied single stream recycling. Um, they also learned Photoshop. They also studied at Philadelphia at the turn of the century when there were factories making incredible material that had environmental themes. We also work with an artist collective, Ms. Rockaway Armada. There are like 15 great artists, um, emerging artists from around the country came and did a residency with our kids. And this one is really special to us. Peace is a haiku song where we worked with the extraordinary poet Sonia Sanchez. And Sonia did haiku workshops throughout the city with 600 kids in our various programs. Uh, we did mini murals, we did the big mural, and we created a beautiful book. And if you go to our website, you can read more about it. But it was like the most inspiring project. See, because I really believe that kids should have a world-class experience in the arts. And in this, we worked with the poet Ursula Rucker and uh, Chip Thomas, a photographer. And here we have all the way live from the 215, like, this is Chris Stain. Really great artist from Brooklyn, and, I, and Chris came, stayed in Philadelphia for a while, and they created a magazine and this project. This one is, we have a new program now, so we work after school, we work in schools, rec centers, community centers, and agencies. And now we're working during the school day, we have an integrated arts model. We've been working with the Lincoln Center Institute, and what we do is we bring together, depending on the grade, all the ninth grade teachers, all the tenth grade teachers, and art becomes at the center. So instead of it going away, it becomes a central focus. And here, the theme was mapping in the history class, in the math class, in the English class. And the kids actually studied mapping, as studied art making, and then they mapped the journey from all over the city to the school, which is in Center City. So this is like psychological journey of their lives and their actual journey. And this is made up of a thousand of their photographs. A wall like this gets turned into this. This is a tribute to the roots. We had another program, Roots 101. So the kids got to study the roots. I mean, how did the roots make it? How did they become famous? They met the roots. They talked to the roots. What does it mean to go from the high school for creative and performing arts and actually be on the Tonight Show? So that was really fun. And now, and then we also wrapped schools because too many schools in Philly look like prisons. And this is part of our integrated model where we bring together math and science teachers and art teachers. Micro to the macro, the kids studied the universe and change the school at the same time. And then we take on really very serious political issues, like the impact of homelessness on young people in our city. The kids who are homeless are not even counted. What kind of decisions can you make policy-wise about that? So we painted an entire neighborhood. We took over an empty house. We turned it into a house that was an art house. We created art about the issue of homelessness. And then we wanted people to go to the third floor, which was a resource room, to talk about the issue. And then we did several other murals. Behavioral health. In Philadelphia, we have a mental health commissioner who is a visionary. He believes that we are an alternative therapeutic model. He says the way we do business is a black box way of working. We send bureaucrats into neighborhoods, they knock on doors, they say, hi, we're here from the city, we're here to help you, and people go, we've received no services, we've received bad services, go away. And so we started working. We started doing small murals, and then the project started getting larger. And then we went to this clinic. It's a methadone clinic. And, and Dr. Evans said to us, I want you to do a major project about addiction and recovery. We looked at the basement. The basement was disgusting. We said, wait a minute, why don't we turn this into an artist studio? And we did. Wait a minute, why don't we offer programs before group therapy? Then a the therapist came to us and said, you know what, people seem more engaged. Then we said, huh, maybe we should, we should get a little, a little bit of money for an evaluation. The evaluators from Yale came to us and said, you know what, you're really on to something. So you know what we did? We finished the project, 1,200 people 1,200 people worked on this. And when I would make site visits, people would follow me to my car and say, I no longer feel like an addict. I feel like an artist. I feel like an artist. So when we applied to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we got a major grant. And out of that, we created the Porch Light Program. And the Porch Light Program is absolutely devoted to using art to overcome the stigma of mental health issues and to heal individuals and connect people back with their community. And guess what? The data was released last week, and it is good. The results of a four-year evaluation from the Yale School of Medicine. The data is good. And that, to us, is absolutely thrilling. And then here, we have a project that was made from found objects because no one in life should be discarded, and we worked with women who had been homeless and their children. And here, 
We did a big project with returning vets from Iraq and Afghanistan. And there are two murals that face each other. And it's called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Because the vet said, we come back to America and we don't know where we are. It is so hard to acclimate. And you know what, at first, the vets didn't want to come. You know who came to our class at first? Vietnam vets. The young vets didn't want to come because they felt such a sense of stigma. And we did a, we recruited heavily. And we worked with this great writing organization, Warrior Writers, and we got people involved. And it was an amazingly inspiring experience. We work with a community in South Philadelphia, with a refugee community, with people from Burma, Bhutan, Nepal. And here, we decided to do something new that's informed our practice over the last four years. We take over empty storefronts. We, we take out all the junk. We turn the storefront into a community center. And in this center, this program is called Southeast by Southeast. We offer everything from ESL to social services to painting, sewing, cooking, mural making. And we clean up the community. We bring in added police presence. We, we're doing greening. There's a huge community garden. I cannot tell you how thrilling it is to see the catalytic power of art. And here, rise and shine. It's a beacon on North Broad Street, 10 stories tall, 10 stories tall, created by 1,000 people, 1,000 people struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues. Restorative justice. Over 2 million people are incarcerated in this country, so what are we going to do about it? You see, because I believe that every issue that is on the desk of Mayor Nutter and City Council should be an issue that we're thinking about. So here we started working in a maximum security prison with lifers who will never see the light of day. They're, they're, it's life without parole in Pennsylvania. Many of them are going to die in prison. But guess what? They have kids. They have grandkids. They are not there in a vacuum. And we are misleading ourselves if we think that. And what we have seen is extraordinary because since we did this project in 2004, we have a mural making program there where the men are creating dozens of murals on parachute cloth every year that go into communities that are bleak throughout the city of Philadelphia. And you know what happens? You know what happens? And I wouldn't have expected this. Many of them have reunited with their kids because their kids are proud of them, sometimes for the first time. So when we talk about poverty and crime and public safety, I want to tell you something. We have to deal with it through a variety of ways because when it comes to intractable problems in our society, our traditional interventions often fail us. So we need to continually, continually embrace innovation and creativity if we are going to crack the code. So here we brought together crime victims and prisoners and did a series called Healing Worlds. Here we talked about the impact and consequences of crime. We worked with kids in a juvenile facility. It's an eighth of a mile long. Here we did a big project about the, the very famous artist Henri Asala Tanner and did a special curriculum. And then here we started to work with people coming out of prison. It was our first reentry project. And this was an epiphany for us, because we thought, OK, so we're working in all these prisons. Maybe we're coming out. 90% of people in Pennsylvania are coming out. What are we going to do? Oh, I know. We're going to create something called the Guild. And what we're going to do is train people in building skills, landscaping, mural making, design, and technology. And then we're going to put people to work reclaiming and transforming public sites throughout the city of Philadelphia. A big project like this about the impact of prison on families with QR codes in it so you can hear the voices. Here we have major transformations at rec centers throughout the city. This was a disgrace. It was, it was in such bad shape. And the city, cities, they just don't have enough money to keep up all their facilities. It's not just Philly, it's all cities. So how can we be value added? So as you transform the individual, you transform the life of the community. It is a win-win. Look at this, beautiful. And then this was a most recent project done by the Guild Program. Look how wonderful that is. That is a Martin Luther King Recreation Center. And it was gray and peeling and graffiti and depressing and uninspiring. And look at it now. And then here is a museum in a, in a part of the city that was so fussy, they didn't even want murals back in the day. They were like, we don't want murals. No, that's a ticket. I said, you, you do the work. You go talk to the Civic Association. So they're like, oh, because well, now there are all these different, you know, the neighborhood's changing. Sure. We did this, and it's won awards. The funder was so happy. And the dedication, he goes, oh, we'll spend $5,000 to light it. I'm like, great. And look at that crowd. And in the crowd, there were the naysayers. I'm like, they've been converted. Yes. Great. <laughs> and then look at this. Beautiful, inspiring. Created by, of course, a master artist, you know, a, assistant artist, but also people 
or in our guild program. And what I want you to know that we believe in pathways. So in art education, you start out in seventh grade. I love the fact that some of our teaching artists started with us in seventh grade. Some of our muralists started with us when they were young. And some of them guild members now have full-time jobs. So we have a jobs developer on staff, but we also hire people when we can. And our recidivism rate, by the way, is 10%. The national average is like 66. Restored spaces. Again, schools look like prisons, so we reclaim the space. Here we do a lot of programs about the environment. This is about global climate change. But we also create outdoor learning structures with recycled materials. Here we build an amphitheater. This is a new project we're doing in West Philadelphia. Ken Beck, wonderful artist from Carnegie Mellon. And then mural restorations. We have a preservation program. We have an advisory committee chaired by a woman who was at the Getty Museum. Here. And now we have this. This is a Keith Haring mural. This was so exciting. We got a big grant from the Keith Haring Foundation to restore that. This is a Richard Haas project. Public art and civic engagement. So we do all this work to serve a social purpose, but we also want to do great art. And we ask ourselves, what is muralism in the 21st century? What do we owe to the field, right? So we're always trying to like be innovative and in be inventive. So here we work with Steve Powers, who did 50 murals all about love along the corridor where the, um, the West Philadelphia subway runs. And there, the, the, our transit agency had shut down a major street for like years, and people were furious. And then this artist comes along and wants to do a project about love. When we went to community meetings, there people were like, we hate you. You know, not me personally, but you know what I mean? And then it was like, we, we kept going back, going back, and people were like, wait a minute. We like them. We like mural arts. This artist, is, he's going to represent us. So we did 50 projects. We then opened up a sign shop. We employed tons of people from West Philly. It was fantastic. It was written up in New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Then we brought in the head of the architecture department at um, MIT. She did light drift so people could change the colors from the shore. It was very exciting. It was a temporary public art project. And then the airport, 85,000 square feet, about the dancer and all of us, because the lead artist said, everyone is photogenic, everybody is beautiful. What do I love about this? I love that the team who worked on this, kids from our art ed program, people from our behavioral health program, people from our public safety program, right? I mean, classically trained photographer at the top of the food chain, but who created it? It was a village. And we had dance workshops throughout the city. So this actually represents thousands and thousands of Philadelphians. And then we also worked with street artists from around the world. Here are just some taste of a few. We also do sculpture at the Navy Yard. And then this one is a huge project at, um, in Center City about the impact of work on our lives. And then we wrap color around 61 buildings with um, Haas and, oh, Haas and Haas and Haas, I always get them confused, Haas and Haas. And this one was all about economic development. This is the second um, hungriest congressional district in the country, a German town in Lehigh. And we partnered with the Commerce Department. As a result of this project, there is a corridor manager, there are new shops, and there is some data about that connection between art and economic development. This is Shepard Ferry. And then here we worked, this is a recent project, we worked with Katarina Grossa, a Berlin-based artist, to do color along seven miles of the Amtrak corridor. There was a great audio component where the artist talked about her work, and we talked about rail corridors, what do we do with them, and then we commissioned the composer. And then upcoming projects, Neighborhood Time Exchange is a really innovative residency in West Philadelphia. We give artists a space, space and time to do their work. In exchange, they have to do something with a social purpose. We have two new programs with the Moore College of Art. We're the laboratory for graduate programs. Open Source is a major exhibition we're doing in the fall where we're bringing 14 extraordinary artists to work in public spaces throughout Philadelphia. It's really huge, risk, risky, challenging, unbelievably inspiring. And here are just some results. And you can go to our website and find out more. But I know that sometimes tangible things are very important. So lots of jobs. We're always looking at economic development. And we're really proud of these, these statistics. <laughs> the cost of doing nothing. I like it. And our porch light evaluation, we'd love to share that with our colleagues around the country. And finally, I just want to say that um, I think that if you ask me what our program is about, it's about impacting individuals, community, and by extension, there's a huge impact on the civic life of the city of Philadelphia as we've turned it into an outdoor museum. And I just want to end with a quote that I really love. Murals show us that social change begins when human beings try to make sense of their lives and defiantly refuse to accept the idea 
that nothing new is possible. Defiantly refuse to accept the idea that nothing new is possible because something is always possible. And the one thing that this job has shown me is that th that hope exists and that art can be a catalyst for that. Um, and I want to say that it is both a, a privilege and a pleasure to do this work. And uh, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. And we have certainly had the privilege of watching things change over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. That was at more inspirational even than I remembered in Philadelphia. So thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to start out asking Jane a few questions, and then we're going to give you a chance in the audience to ask some questions as well. I think there are mics set up on both sides. And um, I think I want to start. It, it's almost overwhelming. Your, your success is almost overwhelming to a community that's just starting to think about this. I mean, it's it really the impact is across so many dimensions. So help us think about how to begin. Um, I would say begin in a way that's really smart by embracing collaboration and partnership. I think that doing a mural, like artists just doing a mural, like I think that's good. But I think if you could bring together the city, a funder, community, and artists, and begin with a bit of a plan. It doesn't have to be like a 10-year plan, but to think about what would, you like, what, what would you like to see in three years and work back from that. Like to say, have like some idea of creating a cluster of work and what that would mean, rather than random projects. And really be clear about what, what are the goals, what's the strategy, what are you trying to achieve? You know, I mean, to really put, you know, Atlanta on the map even more, to create a robust collection of public art that you can, that people will love, to use it as change agents in communities, to use it as a way to represent people who have felt underrepresented. I mean, whatever it is, like to have few goals and then to say, and so in three years, this is exactly what we want to do, and this is how we're going to get there. I feel like anti-graffiti provided us with like, it was a structure and a foundation. Like if I had gone to Philly and had painted a mural, it would have been like, so what? I mean, there's just no way. It would have, it, it, there, there's gotta be some glue. Um, and when we had a conference many years ago, we, told, we even said to people, don't come alone. Try to come with a group. Because if you come alone, as much as we like say yay that you like murals and art, public art, like. Where, where do you want to be in a year or two years? What is your long-term thinking around this? How do you sustain it? I think that's so important. So I want to hear you talk a little bit about the collaborative process. Art, art is very personal, and people's tastes vary widely. Even within one community, people disagree. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you manage that collaboration process. Within a, you have a site. You've picked a community, yeah. now what? So, I, and I just want to be, like, I think the hardest thing is and what you want is you want a great process and great art. And I think that that is really not easy at all. But you have to, like, do homework. There's no shortcut. So we have a community mural making policy, and it's like a zillion steps. And you know what I mean? Not everyone is following every step to the letter of the law, but it gives everybody who works in mural arts, like, a really clear blueprint for what you have to do. So. How do you define community, right? Who, that's hard. Is it three block radius, five block radius? Is it a, you know, a mile? Like who? So we, we say, okay, like five block radius. It's just hypothetical, right? But we go to the council person, the state rep. We go to the rec centers, the schools, the libraries. We do detective work. Are there any community organizations? Is there a town watch group? Like who is in this, who makes up this neighborhood? And we have to flyer. And everybody should know about it. And you, we know that there's always going to be the person who doesn't read the flyer. I didn't know about it even though you flyered over and over again, right? But you have to just do the work. And you have to try to figure out, like, you know, who, who, like, who do we want at the table? And then you'll have a big meeting like this. It could be a big meeting. 
And then you have to figure out, like, what are you going to do? Like, you want to try first to, to get consensus on the fact that there should be a mural. Now, you could ask me, what do you do, Jane Golden? And I don't think we're really good at figuring this out. If there are 9,900 people and three people don't want the mural and everybody else does because those three people can torment me, and they have. So I, I you know what I mean? Like, and I, I, and I will admit, I've given in only a few times, and I've, like, really regretted it, and I'm bitter. <laughs> I want to go back and do it. So, but you try to get consensus. Now, more often than not, Philly, we have a waiting list of like almost 3,000 people who want murals. So we're like in a city that people clamor for art. So that's not so much the problem. So we're at a consensus. And then we have a big chart. And we, we write down what people want, or we put art around the room, pictures of art, have people gravitate to certain images, and then tell us why they gravitated to that. And through this process, we try to figure out what is it that people are saying, who's the artist who could really work on this? And then the artists in the community, a smaller, we say, not everybody, we want an advisory group. And people are busy. So a small group of rep representatives come together with the artists to, to work on what it is. Then we, we have roughs, we have like concept reviews, and then that concept eventually gets turned into a final design that everyone signs off on. So by the time the mural's going up, people should like it. Now that's not the only model we use. Sometimes we bring in artists, sometimes we want to respect that guy who did the industrial ones, that's his vision. We have an art, artist idea challenge. But you still have to make sure wherever it is that people are comfortable with that idea. So we have different community processes for different um, areas, like a business corridor, this corridor, that corridor, neighborhoods. Um, but we try to be as careful and vigilant as possible. So you started your mural career, well, you started in California, but you've worked inside city government for a long time, and you've worked in a public-private collaborative with city government, what what is a what policies from a municipality or a county or a state need to be in place to make this efficient to make this work go smoothly? Well, I mean, I know from Portland and some other cities where murals are zoned as billboards, LA, it, that can have like a chilling effect because if you're going to zone, like if I have to go to zoning or get like lots of permits every time every time we're going to do it. Could you imagine we're doing 100 projects a year? That would be, it could be paralyzing, right? On the other hand, it shouldn't be just willy-nilly, just, you know, I mean, so what, is there some sweet spot here? So, I mean, with historic, the, anything that's historic, there's a mural policy. So what is the mural policy? It's not unlike our policy. We have to post a notice. We have to get people to, you know, we have to get petitions. Well, we get petitions anyway. Um, and, but then it mandates, like, if it's, you know, a brick, certain surface, we can't touch that. I mean, that's fine. I don't, you know, we, we sort of, I, so it's nothing that's really egregious. And many years ago, a billboard company did actually want to see us. They were like, you, why do you get to do whatever you do and we have to go get permits? I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe because we're painting about hope and aspiration and you're doing <laughs> something about genes. You think that has something to do with it? I'm like, seriously? So we just wore him down. <laughs> Finally, he's this lawyer. He goes, you know what? I like. I'm in a rock and roll band at night, and I sort of like artists. So, bye. <laughs> like, so that was like, oh, victory. But I'm simplifying it a bit. It wasn't really. It was scary. But, um, but I think this is the thing. We've made it through four mayors. I hope we make it through five. So the we are part city, and if you look at our total budget, the city part is smaller. Our our budget, what we raise, is much bigger. So it's, but we all feel like public servants. And I treasure, value, feel so lucky about being connected to the city. And I feel the city, and I didn't underscore this enough in the presentation, they feel like protective of us. So they don't want to do anything that's really going to hurt mural arts. So they, whatever procedures are in place, they're reasonable. Like I don't feel anything is really egregious. And I think that Wilson Good, they set that sort of in motion by saying the community answers. So right away, that little snippet of conversation that I told you about, like, that was powerful because in a way, it was like there's power there. And, oh, you know, the world of public art hasn't acknowledged that. But now everyone's talking about social practice, curators, academics, activists, right? Everyone's talking about process versus product. So it's like, oh, the world has changed. That's great. So, um, so I think that there's a way for cities to be supportive of entities doing this work, but also to set some policy. I mean, I think it's fine to not have a zillion, you know, like, you know, there for historic property. I mean, there should be some guidance, some structure, but it shouldn't be onerous. 
what would happen in Philadelphia if somebody wanted to do a mural and not go through the mural arts Oh, program? it happens a lot. We call them rogue murals. We're like, look at that rogue <laughs> mural. Who did that? There's one organization, I, I, will say, I will not say who, but sometimes they do these murals and it's like, oh. And then if the murals deteriorate, they're like, I call us. I'm like, why didn't you just work with us in the beginning? But then it's fine. So, but they can. They can just do it because there's no, like, mural police. There's, you know, there's... And I, I mean, I don't even know whether I would want that role. That would, it would, I feel very conflicted about that. Mm -hmm. Even though, like, I'm, you know what I mean? I spot the murals. Um, but I think, like, so artists like like working with us. You know, when I worked in LA, I used to say to myself, if I'm ever in charge, think it never would be. I want to be like really supportive to artists. So at Anti Graffiti, it wasn't an art program. It was hard to be very supportive to artists. But when we became mural arts, we were like, look, we want to pay artists well. Everyone gets paid at mural arts. Middle school kids get paid. Every like every like people will see. Do people get paid? Yes, that is the answer. Assist everybody. So pay pay people well. We want to um, provide as much support. So that means assistance, building the scaffolding. We have a crew. They do the wall prep. The crew, they're OSHA certified. I mean, this is like serious business. So and and I think that that's really important. So anyway, sorry if I'm going on. Do we have some questions from the? Would you use the mic? This is a very inspiring talk. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. I have two questions. One is, are there any walls left in Philadelphia? <laughs> Believe it or not, Philly is the fifth largest city in the country. It's unbelievable. We're like wall hunters. I, there's a million walls. It's, you know, but I will say, the good center city walls, we've pretty much taken. So for open source, when we have to find walls for JR and Swoon and Shepard Ferry, we're like, oh my god, where are they? But we're, we're being creative. Okay. The other question I have is, do you, you're obviously a dynamo and passionate, and the program wouldn't be like it is if it weren't for you, the, an individual. Do you think your program is, I, this isn't a word, but extrapolatable? <laughs> to other places, do you have a system that you could share with other communities? Yeah, yeah, we are. We, in fact, I talked about it today. We want to create a mural arts university and really sort of like think more seriously and rigorously about our consulting practice because we're doing it now. There are over 200 cities across America that we're working with, more or less, and cities around the world, and we love that. And so we think, you know, this is like we're not going to set up like franchises in different like, you know, Dunkin' Donuts or something in different cities. But, but we really, I mean, look, I feel like, you know what? We've seen art impact cities in ways that were, are unexpected. So, so we have honed things that should be shared, right? People share things with me, and that's why we are where we are. But why are these big city departments embracing the arts, right? I mean, Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Human Services, Department of Prisons, they have budgets between 60 and $100 million. Those commissioners have a lot of issues. Thinking about the arts is not at the top of their list, but they do because they see it as value added. Why does city council, when I testify for my budget, say, Ms. Golden, you should get an increase in your budget? Why? It's just, they might like us. It's because their constituents feel really strongly about this work because they see change because we embrace, like we're always thinking we want to be relevant and impactful. So we think, yes, we do have things to teach in other cities, and there are parts that can move to another, like we could take this program and it could work in, a, in another city. I really, I do believe it can. Will you share that Yale uh, study? The yes, data? yes we will. Yeah, absolutely. Is there another question? Yes, my name is Lyle Harris. I work for MARTA, the public transit system here, and we are trying to uh, belatedly rediscover our artistic creative side. When the system was first built, there was a lot of public art on the system, and still is, but actually it's fallen into disrepair, and we're trying to figure out ways that we can get the public re-engaged in the art that is part of our, our transit system. I was just curious if you've done anything like that with the transit system in Philadelphia and what sort of reception what's, and what sort of results you've seen. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, all right, all tweeting has to stop. <laughs> no, we don't work. With, we, we we don't work. They have a one percent for art program. We don't work with them. That's the that's the that's the simple answer. Um, but I like SEPTA. We we work with them not on the stops or in the concourse. We work like on wall, sort of nearby, and so they've been partners on projects, and they've I've enjoyed working with them. But there's a, you know, this one percent, the one percent for art they have, is 
it's it's very strict about how they operate. So mural art that it goes to individual artists, which is great. So, but we don't partner with them. So, I think about it, but. I try to push my, I try to regroup my excitement <laughs> to other things. It's definitely an opportunity. But, but it's a huge opportunity, huge. And I think a really exciting one that should be, that I'm really glad to hear what you're, how you're thinking. Definitely exciting to explore in this community. Is there a question over here? Yeah, I'm Priscilla Smith from iDrum. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, there's a lot of this kind of advocacy that's been going on in Atlanta for a really long time. I appreciate your persistence and how successful you have been at getting people to pay attention to this. A lot of this of us have been saying this for a long time. What kind of partnerships with existing arts organizations and presenters and people who are working on trying to make Philadelphia be worth living in with art have you established and gone through and how does all that work for you? Well, I think we partner well, one, the city is a partner. Two, community development corporations are partners. A lot of arts institutions, large and small, partner with us in different ways, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, we realize, in a sense, like when you line me up with the big departments, our budget seems very small. Compared to other arts organizations in the city, we're in a privileged experience. We're privileged because we have city funding, and I realize that a lot of organizations don't. Therefore, I feel, and I say this to our staff all the time, like I feel we have a heightened responsibility to partner and to be good collaborators and good thought partners with people. So the truth is, we partner with everyone. This open source exhibition we're doing in the fall, the curator is from Boston. He's worked all over the country. He is stunned. Every time he comes to Philadelphia, he must mention it 10 times, the amount of partnerships that we have to create this exhibition. So do you, do you initiate those, or do people come to you, or does it's it work both. both ways? It's both. But for open source, we're like, oh, we want to work with the Franklin Institute. Oh, we'd like to work with the Barnes. Oh, PMA said they'd be interested. Great. Shepherd Ferry will go talk about the Jasper Johns, and we'll do something huge in the auditorium, and then maybe we'll do something on the steps, and then we'll, you know, and then I'm always talking to their education department about how we can collaborate. And sometimes we don't, but sometimes we do. You know, it's a strange world, because we are all are in these silos. Everyone is sort of chasing money, often the same money, right? So it's competitive. But again, I want to underscore that I just, I feel that we have a big responsibility because we are a city agency. And even if it's a fraction of our budget, it doesn't matter. We need, we are really responsible to the citizens of the city. And, you know, um, I, and, I, and I think about partnership that we have to continually be innovative about partnership as well because it's easy to fall back into that we just are in our lane and we're just gonna do it this way. But there's a lot of power when it works, right? Like the big Katarina Grossa project we did, three rail lines, community groups. I mean, the partners were like all over. Um, the public television station. And, you, and then you start to go, oh my gosh, look what we can cook up. Dan. Thank you, Jane, for being here again and for inspiring us as you do. Talk to us about sustainability. What do you do when these murals are five years old or nine years old or gray and fading and uh, yeah, healing? You're, you're, how, do you, how do you do all that? You, you are, that is the salient question. So anyone doing public art really needs to think about this because if you're not thinking about it, you, it's like it can be. And I just want to say what I said today. Like working in the city of L.A., for me, like L.A. was at the center of the mural universe, right? And then the city funding sort of disappeared, and then it was not unclear who was maintaining it. And I think it's sort of different now. It seems to be like back on track, but a lot of the landmark murals were being graffitied, whited out by graffiti abatement teams. I mean, that would never happen in Philly. The graffiti abatement teams are like our friends. So, but I think there's, you have to be vigilant because you don't want this project turning into the blight that you were sort of, you were, originally set out to eliminate. So it's like, okay, so what do we do? We have a mural preservation division at Mural Arts. It's small, but I like to think, but strong. We restore about 40 projects a year. Some are small restorations, some are huge. We set aside about 100 to $125,000 of city funds, and we leverage it. We raise about, I would say, an additional 25 to 40,000 extra dollars, and we really stretch those dollars. We have several staff artists, so we'll put the staff artists to work. Um, sometimes we can't afford the original artists. Sometimes the original artists aren't around anymore, so we'll ask them to give us direction. Um, 
if we can, if the original artist wants to come back and it works out within our budget, then that's great. We have a, uh, a, an advisory group that's chaired by Cassie Meyer, who comes from the Getty, and she's been great and is teaching us all the time about new sealers and glazes. There are new glazes now where you can actually, it's, um, you can just glaze the mural and the color pops out. But, you know, um, Philadelphia is an old city with old architecture, and some of the buildings have unforeseen problems. It's hard to tell when flashing is pulling away or there are leaks in the roof that you didn't know about or, you know, so-and-so should have fixed the surface and didn't and said they did. And, you know, so I think that's really tricky. So we, tr we also are much smarter about where we pick our sites. And I've argued with our director of operations about sites that I really want to do, but he feels are structurally not sound. And I just, and I have to defer to him because he's right. And we have engineers from the city who come out with us sometimes, and we have great, we have a roofer and a stucco person as well. Um, so it's, it's great because at the same time, a part of our preservation division, it's also we're teaching kids and people in our guild program those skills as well because they're skills they could take and go work with contractors, right? They're jobs, it's jobs. So we're creating jobs and preserving the collection at the same time. So one thing I want to say is, to try to multitask, to do something that is connected to something else, you know, so that you're creating great art, you've got a good process, community feels heard, kids are working, like it's like check, check, check. Like I think that we've been, we try to connect the dots as much as possible. And the preservation program, while it's, it's difficult, it's challenging, has really opened up some great, uh, unique, unforeseen opportunities. In some ways, con talking about connecting the dots, it sounds as though you're in a bunch of different businesses. So you're in the mural business, but you're also in the education business, you're in the preservation business, you're in the social service business, the criminal justice business. How are you connecting all the dots and what kind of a staff do you have to accomplish all of these things? That's a great, great, great question because I don't want you to think like this is mission drift because what connects it, everything? So we say art ignites change. That's what we say at Mural Arts and you see our core values. Well, we believe that everything we do should come back to that and should tie in with our core values or then, then we shouldn't do it. Like if a hotel wants an interior mural, like that's not, you know what I mean? We're not doing it. But if those 15 open source artists who are coming in the fall when we negotiated with them, doesn't matter if it's JR, Shepard Ferry, Swoon, whoever it was, famous as they are, it's like we have a methodology at Mural Arts. That's why it's called open source. Our methodology is open to you. And your talent and genius is open to us in Philly, right? So it's this great exchange. But, you know, if you're coming here just to do art for art's sake, as great as that is, and that is great too, I'm not judging it, but that doesn't really work. So everything. So whether, you know, we want the kids in our program, behavioral health system, public safety, community development work, all of it should change something. There should be something that is different because we were there. And individual change is just as powerful as community change. And when they can mirror each other and connect with each other, then that's fantastic. And look, we're working differently now. We're working with photography, video, sculpture, you know, light, sound. It's we're mural arts, but it's community-based public art that is linked to social change. That is what unifies everything we do. The people, in, we're getting jobs for people coming out of the criminal justice system, but guess what? They're using art to transform neighborhoods, and that's so positive, it underscores their personal transformation. I, you know, when people say, when they come to me, realize, this is the best my life has ever been. Why? We're not an ambivalent employer, but they're bringing beauty to communities, and that is significant. Like, we cannot sort of say it enough. It is huge, and it's in capital letters, and it means something to the people, everyone involved with us, everyone. Sorry, I get so excited to see how I'm going to start jumping up and down soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, two, two short questions. One is, unless I missed it, I haven't heard you talk about the Philadelphia public school system and how does that connect. The second question is, uh, what are the big not-to-dos? Take the first one. Okay, so the public school system in Philadelphia, we have a great superintendent. We have a wonderful mayor. They're trying. It's underfunded. Everybody knows that. We have a new governor who's advocating for a change in the funding formula, um, who knows what's going to happen. In the meantime, lots of kids in Philly do not have art. Um, so we feel, so, and there's, there's no money. Now, many years ago, we had, there was this, um, another superintendent, this is when money wasn't such a critical issue, 
and we had a contract with the district and we provided services to like 25 schools a year, did public art programs, it was fantastic. So after three years, the contract was cut. We were like sad, but we said, okay, we're not gonna stop. So we get a contract from the Department of Human Services and we raise private funds and we put it together and we try to serve as many kids as we can and that's about 15 to 1800 kids. And many of the places where we are are schools because that's where we should be. A few years ago, we decided to go during the school day, but it's very hard to be there during the school day. And it's like, where do you fit in? How do you make it work? So we created this integrated model that brings together math, science, and art. That's one model. The second model is all the ninth grade or 10th grade teachers, and we embed ourselves in the classroom, bottom line, for a year, do major public art, and run programs after school, and keep those kids in the program. So all those kids we met, during that year, they get rooted into the Emerging Muralist program. So we try to be in as many schools as we can possibly fund. And believe me, I want to go, I'd like to take this program to scale. I love our entrepreneurial program. I'd like to train kids in skills related to the creative economy and set them up for post-secondary ed, because I know we can do it because we're doing it on a smaller scale. But I love that our kids are on Etsy. I love that they're making products. You can say, well, what does that have to do with art? We've tapped into their creative potential and we're connecting them to the world. This is 21st century learning skills. What is it about? It's about innovation, collaboration, teamwork, leadership. The mayor's wife, Lisa Nutter, she's like a, a, a pro as it relates to education. She's like, you, your program is a leadership program, Jane. And I'm like, that's right, it is. That's exactly what we're doing. So I feel like you know the public schools have problems and our attitude has to be like, okay, move forward, don't stop, be undaunted. That was it. And the second question was what not to do? Well. I don't, I think, I think that what not to do is to not partner, is to, you have to think about, like those, the images I showed, like, like the art has to be really good. It has to be inspiring, right? And if people have to feel a sense of ownership about it. What? Out of 3,800 murals, how many have been defaced? 10, 12? I mean, that's very powerful, those stats. When I presented at the Getty Museum several years ago with other major cities, people were like, oh, I bet all those murals are defaced. That's what the people in Paris said, Madrid, Rome. And I was like, no, no, actually it's very, very few. But, but, but I think because people feel like a sense of, they're bought into it. People call us and say there's graffiti down the street from the mural. I'm like, thank you, I love it, call me more, <laughs> call back tomorrow. Like, that's what we want to hear. So it's like, wow, how can we be a catalyst for other city services? Back in the day, my former boss used to say, the streets commissioner said a group of artists reported that the pothole hasn't been fixed. Is that you? And I'd be like, guilty. That's me. <laughs> We're busybodies. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's, if you want to be sort of an isolationist policy, you want to go it alone, that's great. But I would say if you want bigger systemic change, you want something that is sustainable, if you want to hit it out of the park for the next years, which I feel you do, this is very serious. We're at this incredible foundation. And ARC, I mean, these are fantastic people behind this. Look, I'm saying I can make a list. And well, I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I live in Philly. Like, I, we can, you can call us, too. <laughs> we would. And we're, and we, I like Atlanta. It seems really nice. So, um, we, you know what I mean? So I think, really, the collaboration is key. And you know what else? There's one other thing that I've learned. And I would say that, you know, it's, it, I've learned from our critics. Like really, really what we've learned is where you course correct and how you be self-reflective, how you evaluate yourself. And when you learn to sort of go like this and where you dig in and say, I believe in this and I'm not bending. Maria, we have time for one last quick question. Well, I'll try to make it as quick as I can. It sounds like yours is a City of Philadelphia program. I'd like for you to talk about how you relate to the rest of the region. You understand that what was just announced tonight is a regional program. Mm -hmm. I know you had a tour of Atlanta today. I wondered if you could, it seems like as ambitious as we are, it's still very modest, especially in comparison to what you have been able to accomplish in Philadelphia. Could you give us your assessment critique of where we are and are we trying to be overly ambitious in a metropolitan, trying to be dilutive maybe, uh, doing the whole region when you have been able to accomplish so much in just the city of Philadelphia? It's a great question, but I want you to think about Philly because it seems like a, like a monolith, right? So Philly, 
But really, Philadelphia is giant. And if I'm working in the Northeast, that's like working in a different city. If I'm in Southwest, a different city. So I understand the question, but I think it can work. Because the truth is that like where I was this morning when people were talking about, like there's a new, they go, they, there are a lot, there's, I don't know, where did we start out this morning? Um, Hakesville. Right. So there was a transformation of a depot. I mean, they're really thinking about creative placemaking, very different from a more industrial part of the city where we were this afternoon. And so things will work differently in different places. And it doesn't have to be like, it's not one size fits all. But if you have some parameters, like this is how we work, and these are like core values, this is like what we believe in, and this, sorry, and this is what sort of, you know, I, I think that that can, everybody can subscribe to that, but sort of interpret it in their own way. And you will have developed, like in Philly, a, there is a robust body of work that is thematically as varied as the experience that you would find if you walk through the Philadelphia Museum of Art and go from collection to collection. And that's really what you want. You want that you could drive from one region, to, uh, from one area to the next through Atlanta, the center of the city proper, and then the outskirts, and find like this extraordinary collection of art that's in the region. I mean, that would be, right? Well, we get calls. I mean, the number of calls from the outskirts of the city is high. So we, and we've actually done work in some of the cities around. I mean, you know, even when I was here today, people are sort of clamoring for work in Camden. We've worked in Trenton. We've worked in cities throughout Pennsylvania pretty intensively. I mean, Pittsburgh has a, and it's not close by, but, you know, there's Reading, York. There's lots of cities that have mural programs because they study Philadelphia in the region you know, there, there are definitely, like, efforts. It's more, there's much smaller, but inspired by Philadelphia. But because Philadelphia is so vast, our efforts, the work production stays within the city limits. Our consulting efforts have certainly been for people regional. They haven't really taken off in as robust a way as I would like for the region. And I'm sure that's, I mean, I, it has a lot to do with politics and will to make it happen. But what's happened in Philadelphia, which did not happen 15 years ago, is that every part of the city is engaged. And that says a lot, considering how huge and diverse our city is. Jane, thank you. My apologies. We're, we don't have time for any more questions, but thank you. I come from Columbus, Ohio, and people in Columbus have been asking me, why did the convention go to Philadelphia? I found out tonight. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Jane, thank you for inspiring us. Thank some you, of thank us you again, everybody. Some of us a first time, some of us again, some of us on the web, some of us in person. We are grateful. We look forward to working with you on a continued basis. You really are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. We humbled by your generosity. <laughs> go to publicart.atlantaregional.com to learn more about the new program, the new ARC program, and be in touch with Blank Foundation or ARC if you have ideas. Thank this you. is so exciting. I'm so happy for you guys. <laughs>